Good morning, friends. Welcome to OBE Journal 2017, number 28, I believe. <laughs> Maybe it's 29, I'm not exactly sure. It's a little early in the morning. Um, I will certainly correct it on the title. Uh, moving right along <laughs> from uh, yesterday's uh, chat with Arthur Conan Doyle. I would uh, like to uh, take you back to uh, Arthur's, um, Mr. Conan Doyle, rather, don't know him that well, um, initiation and commitment to the spiritualist cause around um, the 1915-1918 era. And I have a book, which a biographical book, which uh, quotes from original sources and will give you a, a very uh, keen and sort of accurate portrayal of the sort of thing that was going on then and how uh, spiritualism faced a mighty opposition uh, and tried to uh, convince themselves, themselves and their opposition that uh, evidence was what was needed, incontrovertible evidence, that what a spirit was saying was 100% true and revealed uh, a situation or a truth that no one present at the seance could possibly know. And um, this is evidential spiritualism. Uh, I don't practice it that much myself, in fact, hardly at all. But um, uh, there are still many uh, adherents to that, that set of principles uh, around the world. And uh, I feel it's, it's a battle that's already been won. And it's a battle no longer worth fighting. Uh, we have to move on, and I felt this for years, to a reveal the bigger picture um, the bigger modern picture, uh, which, you know, I did with my first book, uh, Eternal Life and How to Enjoy It, and um, also uh, explore our potential to communicate not only with our departed loved ones, which of course is important, but to expand beyond that to uh, various types of humanity, various uh, nations, religions, attitudes, and uh, the various forms of uh, incarnation and uh, souls, uh, souls attitudes that uh, vary depending on where the reincarnation cycle they are. So I just, I just feel that we should be uh, exploring the bigger picture, basically. And, uh, but, you know, I recognize that evidential spiritualism was where we started, or where the tradition started. And um, I think it's, it's interesting and uh, somewhat amusing to uh, hear the struggles they went through in those days. So from the book, Through a Glass Darkly, by Stefan Bechtel and Lawrence Roy Staines. Let us uh, explore a little bit here. Um, there's a lot of material here, and uh, they um, cover in, in detail uh, Conan Doyle's gradual exposure to spiritualism and various mediums around and about where he was over a couple of years becoming convinced. And I'll take you up, and at a certain point, he sort of does become convinced and becomes a proponent, a public proponent. And let me uh, touch on the uh, <laughs> latter part of that uh, process. On November 4, 1916, the spiritualist journal Light published a short but earnest essay by one A. Conan Doyle, his official coming out party as a spiritualist. He summed up his new convictions in a single sentence. Quote, in spite of occasional fraud and wild imaginings, there remains a solid core in this whole spiritual movement. 
which is infinitely nearer to positive proof than any other religious development with which I am acquainted. For Doyle, the accumulation of evidence from multiple sources was so strong that it could now be considered proven. The phenomena had passed from the stage of being a parlour game, was now just emerging uh, from being a debatable scientific novelty, quote unquote, and was beginning to take shape as the foundation of a, quote, definite system of religious thought, end quote. From both sides of the partition, quote unquote, <laughs> that separates this world from the next, he wrote, people of integrity and high intellect were trying to break through to the other side, while spirits on the other side were doing the same. Both were, quote, beating down the partition, and we can hear the sound of each other's picks, end quote. Someday soon, spirit communication would be acknowledged as a breakthrough comparable to the birth of Christ, but not in conflict with Christianity, a revelation that would provide believers with a, quote, utter fearlessness of death and an immense consolation when those who are dear to us pass beyond the veil, end quote. The following year, October 17, um, Conan Doyle gave his first public lecture on spiritualism to the London Spiritualist Alliance, sharing the podium with Sir Oliver Lodge. And by now, Conan Doyle was not alone. Though at first Lady Jean had been alarmed by her husband's explorations into the shadowy world of the occult, considering it to be, quote, uncanny and dangerous, end quote, she had by now enough first-hand evidence that she, too, became convinced of the reality of spiritualism. Now no longer would either one of them be a dabbler or a stander in the doorway of the great questions concerning human survival of bodily death. They had become true believers. There's always a negative connotation to that phrase, two true believers, as though you're some kind of one-issue fanatic. And um, I'm not sure that's fair to use that phrase. But anyway, they've used it. For Conan Doyle, the severest tests of his newfound convictions would come only a few weeks before the end of the war, but it also led to the most exalted moment of his life. In 1916, during the Battle of the Somme, Doyle's beloved son, Arthur Elaine Kingsley, known as Kingsley, who was serving in the Army Medical Corps, took two bullets in the neck. In some ways, this serious but non-fatal wound was a lucky chance. In a single day during the bloodbath of the Somme and an assault on the German trenches, just short of 20,000 British soldiers were mowed down by machine gun fire. The worst day by far in British military history. To Doyle's great relief, Kingsley managed to recover in a military hospital. Later he returned to active service, because do but because doctors were in su such short supply, he was recalled to the medical school at St Mary's Hospital. It was there that he became one of the millions of victims of the Spanish flu that swept across the world. He died on October 28, 1918, less than a month before the war ended. Uh, Doyle's brother Innes was also to die in the flu epidemic four months later. Yes, between the, uh, the, war, the war and the flu, many, many people uh, lost multiple family members, let's put it that way. <laughs> When Doyle got the news about Kingsley's death in a telegram from his older daughter, Mary, he was preparing to give a lecture on spiritualism. He decided not to cancel the talk, but carried on as planned, later saying he could never have done that without the inner serenity provided by his spiritualist convictions. Um, I've, I've had that experience, but you know, all, all, medium, all practicing mediums do. Um, and at this point in my life, I'm kind of farther along on the inner journey than Doyle was then. But uh, just a small point. Still, Kingsley's death was a staggering blow. He was such a gallant young man, so gentle, so principled, so reserved, a brave soldier, and a fine officer who would have made a splendid doctor. It was almost a year later, on the evening of September 7, 1919, that Sir Arthur gave a spiritualist lecture in, the, in a guild hall in the town of Portsmouth on the British seacoast about 60 miles south of London. Also on the platform that night was a somewhat improbable figure of a Welsh coal merchant from Merthyr Tydfil named Evan Powell. But Powell with his unkempt hair and his ill-buttoned waistcoat stained with coal dust was also, according to Doyle, 
an extraordinarily gifted medium, shuttling message between the land of mist and the earthly world. Doyle was impressed with Powell because he did not accept any money for his mediumship. That was always an issue, those that took money and those that didn't. And when I got started, you know, quite a few years ago, um, I, I tussled with the issue too. But if you, uh, the thing is, you're going to spend a lot of time doing it. Um, and I did, I don't, I spent a bit of time now, maybe not as much, but, you know, back then I did quite a bit between that and healing. Um, you're taking time away from other money earning activities. And, um, uh, and I also felt people sort of really wanted to pay. So you have to find a, a sort of happy medium between uh, uh, what seems appropriate and what um, people feel comfortable with. Anyway, yeah, all mediums go through this. And uh, certainly in the early days, some famous ones got quite wealthy. And if some of the famous ones seem to be uh, from time to time fraudulent, because their powers would um, come and go. They'd, and uh, on days when the powers weren't there or good enough or strong enough, they'd fake it a bit. But that didn't mean they faked it all the time. They just, you know, public mediums, busy, a bit like musicians going through the motions on certain concerts because they do so many. Anyway, uh, uh, they got tagged with a lot of uh, fraudulent stuff. And of course, some of them were completely fraudulent from the word go. Um, so there's a mixture there and uh, the whole thing of fraudulence and uh, in mediumship is, is another, you know, fairly long story, but um, it's certainly the issue of, of how much money they made uh, or didn't make uh, lent either credence or, you know, doubt to their activities. did not accept any money for his mediumship and because he only lent his psychic services to occasional clients. <laughs> Doyle believed his powers were free from that deterioration which comes from overstrain. Well, there you go. In, the history, in his book, The History of Spiritualism, Doyle opined that, quote, on the whole, Evan Powell may be said to have the widest endowment of spiritual gifts of any medium at present in England. He was also a, quote, kindly, good person, worthy of the wonderful gifts entrusted to him. Uh, those gifts including moving objects at a distance, psychic lights, and direct voice phenomena, sometimes including the eerie ability to channel more than one voice at a time. He had given many sittings at the British College of Psychic Science. Um, that's certainly um, the direct voice phenomenon, or the original voice comes through the voice of the medium that was much more practiced then than than now i find i i find it hard to um discover anyone that does that now somebody must do it but you never seem to hear about it and and you know i certainly don't and but not that i've tried but it was co more common then uh, leslie flint for example although he was slightly later than this was uh, quite a marvel at that direct voice uh, uh channeling and you can hear tapes of his on various websites. If you just uh, Google Leslie Flint, that's L-E-S-L-I-E-F-L-I-N-T. Uh, you'll come across more than one website that has, uh, it's all digitized now, um, recordings of Flint doing all sorts of people, uh, channeling all sorts of people. And um, he did it, uh, I think, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. And... Um, Quite, quite, quite remarkable. Um, after Doyle's lecture that night, Powell offered to give a private sitting for Sir Arthur Lady Doyle, three spiritualists, and a well-known film producer named Harry Engholm, who was, quote, intellectually convinced of the reality of spiritualism, but had never seen it in person. Before the sitting began, quote, Mr. Powell insisted on being searched and was then bound to me by a wooden armchair. Doyle wrote later in an article called A Wonderful Seance, which appeared in the spiritualist journal Lights, Christmas 1919. Then Doyle, quote, cut six lengths of stout twine and tied the medium in six places to the arms and legs of the chair. So thoroughly was this done that at the end of the sitting it was quite impossible to loosen him and we were compelled to cut him free. 
end quote. Powell was bound hand and foot to prevent fraud, of course, but also, quote, for his own protection, end quote. Doyle explained, quote, since he cannot be responsible for his own movements when he is in a trance, end quote. Imagine that, all getting all tied up. <laughs> Next, a small megaphone circle, circled with luminous paint to make it visible in the dark was placed on the floor beside the medium. The attendees arranged themselves in a semicircle holding hands, surrounding Powell but not touching him. And then the lights were turned out and the room was in total darkness, a customary practice that has always drawn the scorn of skeptics. You know, because, you know, people can scuttle around in the dark, not the people sitting there, but some uh, wily assistants, you know. And that did happen, um, obviously, uh, especially if people were out to make money. <clears throat> Uh, the seance sitters could hear Powell's breathing groan loud and laboured as he sank into a trance. Then a voice, quite unlike Powell's normal voice, spoke up. Powell, being Welsh, had a distinct accent and his voice was gentle and musical. But the new voice, that of Powell's control, named Black Hawk, was, quote, deep, strong and virile, end quote, Doyle reported. Black Hawk greeted the company with a good-natured kidding, call, calling Doyle Great Chief, but also addressing each person by name. Then the medium slipped into silence and there was no, a sound of snoring. <laughs> a short while later, Doyle reported seeing the luminous band of megaphone lift into the air and circle around the sitter's heads, sometimes slowly, sometimes swiftly, but always as smoothly as if it were attached to the end of a string. Then it vanished. Shortly afterward, it returned, this time with a handful of flowers taken from the mantle and shoved into the narrow end of the megaphone. This was passed around the room so that everyone could smell the flowers, and with an accuracy which showed that whoever held them could see very plainly where we were. Hmm. <clears throat> then, most surprising of all, a heavy wooden pedestal that Doyle estimated to weigh 40 or 50 pounds was moved from the corner of the room to the center of the circle, lifted off the ground and balanced gently on the top of Doyle's head, and then rubbed lightly down the edge of his neck. That's a wooden pedestal that was 50 pounds. <clears throat> Quote, an examination had shown us that the heavy crown of this pedestal was balanced upon a single loose screw in a wide socket so that any careless handling would have sent it down with a terrific effect upon our skulls. Then came to me what was the supreme moment of my spiritual experience. It was almost too sacred for full description, and yet I feel that God sends us such gifts that we may share them with others. Suddenly there was a whispered voice in the darkness. Jean, it is I. Lady Doyle felt a hand on her head and cried, It's Kingsley! <clears throat> Father, the voice whispered earnestly, Dear boy, is that you? Conan Doyle asked, scarcely able to believe it was true. He had the sense that there was a face very close to his own. He could hear someone breathing. In a voice that sounded very much like Kingsley's voice, the entity replied in a very intense whisper, Forgive me. There was never anything to forgive, Conan Doyle replied. You were the best son a man ever had. Then a large, strong hand rested on Sir Arthur's head and gently bent it forward. Then he felt a soft kiss just above the brow. <clears throat> Tell me, dear, are you happy? Sir Arthur asked. There was a silence, and Doyle feared his son was gone. Then softly, in a sort of sighing voice, came the words, Yes, I am so happy. <clears throat> While this remarkable conversation was in progress, Doyle was dimly conscious that the medium across the room seemed to be simultaneously channeling a second voice. Harry Engholm, the film producer, read, later wrote of this, quote, While Sir Arthur and his boy were carrying on a conversation of a very private and sacred nature, I was suddenly addressed by a very dear old friend, a well-known newspaper correspondent, in terms and on a subject that left no doubt in my mind as to who the unseen personality was. Several times later in his life, Conan Doyle would have had what he believed to be direct communication with Kingsley, but none of them compared with the unearthly thrill of this moment. 
Now I can tell you that uh, medium channeling two people simultaneously is uh, quite remarkable and uh, not repeated very often. I certainly haven't heard of it much. I mean, I can certainly channel two people one after the other. Two people, you know, one, one person talking to a client in the room and then I'll say, okay, now so-and-so stepped in and is saying this, but not, you know, two simultaneously. Because it was, sounds to me like Kingsley was allowed to appear or ma manifest through the energy body of the medium um, and speak um, independently. Whereas the, uh, the medium's over there and uh, using his voice is being used for the, the second person. Anyway, there's no direct uh, description of that, but that's my uh, uh, perception. No. Later, it was alleged that when Conan Doyle emerged from the seance, he declared, Sherlock Holmes has died. Whether or not this actually happened, it was clear that from now on, he was no longer an author of detective stories, but a missionary for the cause of spiritualism. In those years of, quote, universal sorrow and loss, he wrote at the end of his autobiography, it was borne upon me that the knowledge which had come to me was not for my own consolation alone, but that God had placed me in a very special position for, for conveying it to that world which needed it so badly. Um, yes, that, that's generally my impression for uh, uh, the gifts one receives on one's inner journey. They're given to you so that you relay that gift to others. Um, that's definitely a, a spiritual truth as far as I'm concerned. It still is. <laughs> From now on, he pledged he would share the good news of the soul's eternal survival, no matter its personal cost to him and his family, no matter its financial cost, and no matter how much ridicule would be heaped upon him. And in the years to come, there would be plenty. Essentially, he would be seated in the public square wearing a dunce cap, pelted with rotten tomatoes and scorned by many of the same people who once bought his books and considered him one of Britain's leading literary lights. Yeah, he, he paid for his, uh, he paid for his uh, uh, personal salvation, if you like. But who could argue with the evidence he had seen with his own eyes? He summed it up as a kind of personal confession and recitation of faith in the book, Memories and Adventures. I have clasped material hands. I have held long conversations with the direct voice. I have smelt the peculiar ozone-like smell of ectoplasm. I have listened to prophecies which were quickly fulfilled. I have seen the dead glimmer upon the photographic plate which no hand but mine had touched. I have received through the hand of my own wife notebooks full of information which was utterly beyond the, her ken. I have seen heavy articles swimming in the air, untouched by human hand, and obeying directions given to unseen operators. I have seen spirits walk around the room in fair light and join in the talk of the company. I have known an untrained woman possessed by an artist spirit to reproduce rapidly a picture now hanging in my drawing room, which few painters could have bettered. If a man could see, feel and hear all this, and yet remain unconvinced of unseen intelligent forces around him, he would have a good cause to doubt his own sanity. Why should he heed the chatter of irresponsible journalists or the head shaking of in the inexperienced men of science, when he has himself had so many proofs? For Doyle, the matter had been proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. Now he wished only to discern the majestic mystery that lay around him and share its eternal reassurance with the world. Striking an achingly high note, and one that laid himself open to even more attack and ridicule, he concluded his little book, The New Revelation, with a beatific vision written by English poet and spiritualist named Gerald Massey. Spiritualism has been for me in common with many others, such a lifting of the mental horizon and letting in of the heavens, such a formation of faith into facts that I can only compare life without it to sailing on board a ship with hatches battened down 
and being kept a prisoner, living by the light of a candle, and then suddenly, on some splendid starry night, allowed to go on deck for the first time and see the stupendous mechanism of the heavens all aglow with the glory of God. Um, and from a, a further chapter called the St. Paul of Spiritualism, now let's hear a little bit about uh, the debates they used to have. Um, this I find particularly fascinating. Uh, the event would be nothing more than two men arguing for a couple of hours, but all 2,400 tickets were sold out a month in advance. Surely there were better things to do on a Thursday night in London. Regardless, a crowd filed into Queen's Hall March the 11th, 1920, to attend a clash of opinions billed as a truth of spiritualism. Arguing in his defense was, of course, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He had been spiritualism's defender in chief for three years now, bringing to it a combative and aggressive spirit which it lacked before, if he did say so himself. He had written the new revelation and the vital message and several dozen articles and letters. He and Lady Jean had been crisscrossing Britain, giving lectures to packed halls, often five nights a week and addressing a total of 150,000 people, he estimated. And he was relishing the role. In January 1919, he had written to his mother, quote, someone has called me the St. Paul of the New Dispensation. What are we getting to? Nonetheless, he was particularly anxious about this debate. He'd known it wouldn't be just another hall full of admiring souls in Hastings. It would be a confrontation, and he hated confrontation. I go into battle in good heart, was his rather melodramatic choice of words to his mother a few days before. This will, in a way, be the most important night of my life, so I pray that you think of me. His adversary was Joseph McCabe, a Franciscan priest who had left the church militant to become a militant atheist. Consider the irony. A former friar argues for a godless universe while the creator of a supremely rational detective, Sherlock Holmes, claims that we can talk to the dead. It was a surreal scene benefiting the new century. But more than that, McCabe's appearance that night signaled a new opposition to spiritualism. The rising opponent wasn't the stuffy Church of England or the irate nonconformists. It was loss of faith itself. World War I had brought on so much death and misery that millions of people now had no patience for blather about the hereafter and a loving God. Important point that. We think uh, skepticism and uh, cynicism and disbelief is a new thing. It's not that new. Long before television and the internet and uh, obsession with, uh, how shall I say, ambition, pleasure, and uh, recreational drugs, there was uh, this level of, uh, mainly because of the war, I think. Uh, it, it involved so many people and seemed so pointless, the First World War, uh, that, as I say, said before, um, it created a need, and a need for a new understanding of life, and uh, a lot of people didn't get to that new understanding of life, they got to the rejection of the old understanding of life first, and were stuck there. At Queen's Hall, as Queen Hall filled that night, each man was backed up by his chosen supporters on stage with him. 50 spiritualists to Conan Doyle's right, 50 atheists to McCabe's left, like two little armies. They sat glaring at each other as the evening's moderator, Sir Edward Marshall Hall, a famous defence secretary and former MP, quickly got down to business. This is a serious debate, he warned the audience in his brief opening remarks. Both of these gentlemen are in earnest. McCabe was up first and he began his 40-minute segment with a theme sure to please his supporters. Religion was all well and good when humans believed the world was flat and the sun revolved around the earth. But with the advent of modern astronomy, quote, man found himself living on one tiny speck in an illimitable material universe. The result, the old creeds began to grow dim. We've grown up, he said. 
Millions are fast falling from this dream of an eternal home. But wouldn't you know it, just when men are beginning to wonder if at last religion is doomed, there comes this portentous phenomena we are discussing in the shape of spiritualism. I do not wonder that my opponent takes it to be a new religion, a new revelation. But there's one big problem with this new religion, said McCabe. It was born of a fraud. It was created in fraud. It was natured, nurtured in fraud. It is based today to an alarming extent all over the world on fraudulent performances. And with that line, he got his first sympathetic laughter from the crowd. He spent the next half hour poking fun at D.D. Holm, Sir Oliver Lodge and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and he got lots more laughs. After saying Doyle had, has lived in clouds in a mist, McCabe ended his opening speech on a somewhat different note. To great cheers from the audience, or half of it anyway, he said, I submit to you in conclusion, let us be satisfied with this great broad earth which we do know and control, can control. Here is a world with mighty problems, a world with mighty resources. Here is a world which in its great tasks is fit to absorb the energy and devotion of every living man and woman on its surface. Let us leave that cloudy, misty, disputable, misleading world and let us concentrate upon this earth in which we live. This argument, let us take each world in its turn, had been a rejoinder since the dawn of spiritualism. As a practical matter, spiritualism involved so much time and effort, for what reward? Horace Greeley was at the end of his life agnostic on the whole matter, but wrote on his autobiography, quote, those who discharge promptly and faithfully all their duties to those who still live in the flesh can have little time for poking and peering into the life beyond the grave. Better to attend to each world in its proper order. He wrote this in 1868, a few years after Henry David Thoreau's famous reply on his deathbed when asked if he was ready to meet his maker in the next world. One world at a time. In the 20th century, this attitude gained in popularity as a more secular world offered more distractions, of course, from motor cars to Mae West. <laughs> motor cars to Mae West. He wrote this, uh, sorry, um, and then more pressing, pedals. Later, Conan Doyle would say it himself, although ruefully. Uh, when the whole world is living vividly here and now, there seems to be no room for the hereafter. And um, that, that certainly is a challenge we face. And I would certainly, uh, f you know, promote the, the, uh, the philosophy, if you like, or the attitude that we should live in the here and now. But uh, when you fully explore that in meditation, as I've said before, the here and now, the, the, the present moment expands to fill the apparent past and the apparent future. So it's, it's not as simple a nostrum as it may seem, living in the, the now. How did Conan Doyle reply to 40 minutes of McCabe? By brandishing a notebook. I have in this little book the names of 160 people of high distinction, people who, to their own great loss, have announced themselves as spiritualists. These are folk who have taken real pains and care to get to the bottom of the subject. They have not been to one seance or two or three like McCabe. Many have studied for 20 or 30 years and been to hundreds of seances. Yes, Doyle admitted, there are fraudulent mediums. He called them hyenas. I think that to deceive the living by imitating the dead is the most horrible crime a man can commit. But many, many other mediums are honest people who suffer for their gifts. You don't hear about them, said Doyle. The trouble is that you never hear of mediums unless they get into trouble to which the audience shouted, hear, hear. He then launched into a defense of the mediums McCabe had mocked and told stories of respected people he knew and their visits with mediums who established contact with dead relatives. Doyle claimed that he knew more than a hundred of such cases personally. If I had more than a hundred, he continued, how many thousands of and tens of thousands there must be in the country? A flourish that drew cheers from the crowd. That is what our opponents will never admit, the enormous cumulative evidence of all these cases. Then he got uh, personal. He told of a seance in Wales in which he was visited by the spirit of his younger brother who had died in the great flu epidemic of 1918. 
Four spirits came to me in succession, each of them making that identity perfectly clear. The fourth was my brother. When I asked for a name, he gave Innes. The name published in his obituaries was John Francis, and Innes was his third name, used only by intimates. Besides my wife and myself, I do not think there was a person in Wales who could have known this. I at once began talking family matters with him, exactly as if he were alive. His widow is in ill health in Copenhagen, and we discussed her condition. I asked him if he thought psychic or magnetic treatment could avail. He answered by the two words, Sigurd Freyr, or Trier. I don't know if that's Trier or Trier. Uh -huh. I could not catch it, and he repeated it twice. Mr. Southey, an ex-JP of Merthyr, with his daughter, was on my left, and my wife was on my right. They all made note of the words. Next day I wrote to a young Danish friend in London and asked him if he had any meaning, if the words had any meaning. He replied that it was the name of a well-known psychic in Copenhagen. Now I will swear to you that I did not know there was a spiritualistic society in the whole of Denmark. As to the Welsh people who formed the circle, they could have no, not known that the conversation was going to Copenhagen. Now, if that entity who stood in front of me in the dark, who talked in my brother's manner, and who discussed family matters intimately, and who knew more about the surroundings of his widow than I did, was it, was it not my brother? If, if it was not, I ask you, who was it? Half the audience knew the answer, and the other half didn't care. <laughs> the two men spent the next hour bickering over the details of their early remarks. McCabe got in his one last plea for one world at a time argument. Quote, this movement is one vast mischievous distraction of human energies from the human task that lies before us today. And Doyle, as ever, was the earnest defender of those who must suffer in silence. I am sure McCabe would not have talked so lightly of this matter if he had known, as I know, the consolation it has brought to thousands and thousands of people. The debate was a draw, but McCabe had gotten under his skin. Three months later, in June 1920, Doyle sat down and wrote, quote, a drastic examination of Mr. Joseph McCabe, in which he meticulously answered all the objections that McCabe tossed about. But Doyle went beyond proofs. McCabe was an arrogant killjoy who told outright lies and did so, quote, in a short snip-snap sentences, as if that were the final word on the matter. Quote, everyone who differs from him is a fraud, a fool, or a drunkard. Doyle noted of the man's debating style. As for the one world at a time argument, let's find for a healthy man on a fine summer day. But how about the poor wretch who lives in a garret in London winter, in a London winter with cancer of the bowels? Strangely, that's just how Joseph McCabe died 35 years later, broke and alone in London. The cause of death was pneumonia following prostate cancer, and it was winter. There's much more in this book. As you can well imagine, Doyle started traveling the world, America, Australia, and uh, you know, getting to Australia in those days took a month on a ship, which may have been a pleasant month. I would, I would I'd add hastily. But I think you can see the, uh, the, uh, the scene there. And, uh, uh, it gives us a, a basis and a reference point for our own work, our own journeys. And uh, we can see where we're coming from. Um, prior to the developments of the mid-19th century, such uh, interactions with the dead were not so much spoken of, um, certainly not much written about, and because of the uh, 
suppressive forces of the church um, hidden really and um, I think a number of uh, psychically gifted people who may also have been uh, herbalists and quote unquote witches and including the male version of the witch and lived quietly and brutally um, passed their lives in quiet service to the community and uh, did not write about their experiences. I am convinced that there's always been psychically gifted people in any community and uh, but the uh, practice did not get uh, codified and ritualized until the advent of spiritualism in the mid 19th century and aided to some degree by uh, the uh, the theosophical movement which was uh, birthed around the same time a little later and um, we owe a lot to both of those movements they are to a large degree from which we spring there are other uh, um, tributaries of knowledge that have come trickling down underground streams uh, from as, as I've said many times uh, ancient Egypt and Greece particularly uh, um, uh, the uh, contributions of uh, uh, underground brotherhoods and mystery schools uh, the, uh, that go to make up what I would call the Western esoteric tradition um, which taught you know certainly various kinds of consciousness projection no doubt about that and uh, uh, some version of uh, past life regression um, and some uh, version of contact with uh, um, elementals, nature spirits, you know, angels, you know. Um, and perhaps one day we'll e explore that if I uh, find a book that's got the appropriate quotes. Because <laughs> it's quite a large subject, of course. Um, converse with spirits has always existed. It rise, it's so pub, publicity, it, it's uh, public image uh, sort of rises and falls with the uh, amount of uh, acceptance or repression that the political and religious structure of the society uh, offers. Um, and the arguments that we've just heard are the classic arguments. Do we live in this world and make it a better place with our own efforts? Uh, do we behave as decent human beings without the promise of a, a post-mortem reward, as the humanists would uh, uh, say and do say? Uh, or do we uh, expand our understanding uh, and uh, realize in that expansion that the uh, state of this world, this physical plane, is um, not quite as all-consumingly important as uh, those who would offer the ar other argument uh, will attest that uh, it is only a temporary stage, a marvelous playground on which we can learn certain games with our fellows and uh, again gain some proficiency in those games and some uh, wisdom from the experience of playing those games and then take that um, proficiency and uh, wisdom along with us to the next stage of life. 
Do we focus on this world or do we focus on all worlds? Obviously, with humanity, there's always going to be a bit of both. And I certainly would not decry the efforts of those who uh, uh, focus on uh, making uh, this world a better, more harmonious uh, place uh, with progressively less suffering and uh, progressively more equality and kindness and compassion. Um, there is, I believe, uh, room for all of those attitudes and activities. Different types of souls on different stages of their journey will be attracted to the various aspects of uh, uh, human endeavor that we've just outlined. Um, it's pretty obvious that we <laughs> to which aspect we belong, but, um, and, you know, it's just another stage on the journey. Um, and you can look back or over at your friends and family members that are, that are in the, firmly established in the other camp and uh, wish them well. And also, also be a willing resource for them when that uh, reality structure crumbles due to suffering and death, as, it, as, as we know, as it always does. The uh, secure reality of physical plane, pl striving and pleasures and commitments uh, often crumbles. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's other aspects to that, other manifestations of it. Uh, people who commit themselves to political reform and idealism um, often uh, uh, get caught up in serving that, a political ideal. And it almost always ends in uh, delusion and despair because political movements are generally riddled with uh, corruption and those uh, who are uh, fraudulent and uh, using the political uh, aspirations and idealism to forward their own, uh, you know, business concerns, their own business uh, expansions. And uh, I often notice people whose belief system around that has crumbled and uh, they're in a, in a place of cynicism and despair. And... Uh, looking for a new belief system to latch on to. <laughs> I remember uh, talking to uh, uh, one of my favorite high school teachers, uh, you, this is years ago, and he spoke of another teacher as having gone from, in one step from Calvinism to communism w without stopping anywhere in between. And um, he just laughed about it. I, I barely knew the guy he was talking about, but. It just seemed, uh, you know, funny to me. And uh, I was only about 19 at the time, so it seemed like a very, very sort of wise remark. And uh, it stuck with me all these years. So um, have I gone from uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Christianity to spiritualism? Uh, not quite that simple. Um, I've breezed through a number of belief systems and I continue to breeze through them now because I don't particularly wish to uh, stay in any one of them because each, each belief system uh, has its uh, uh, ability to expand your understanding and then enclose it within new definitions. You know, you sort of push back the boundaries, but they're, they're still there. They're pushed back, but they're still there. And uh, I prefer to live in a place where um, boundaries are very flexible uh, and transparent. And uh, I would encourage you to do the same. And uh, tomorrow we shall uh, return to uh, personal explorations. I just thought this uh, little sidestep would be uh, interesting and useful. And I hope you feel the same way. So uh, until then, 
So long, friends.